Good morning. I just appreciate you all being here. I appreciate Lou for that special she played during the offertory. <laughs> Nothing like the classics. Thank you for that. And uh, Acts chapter 2. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2 if you would today, please. We're going to read just a few verses, but I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of background without reading because there's quite a bit that would have to be read. But in Acts chapter 2, we see the, the birthing or the beginning of the New Testament church as, as we know it today. We see a brand new beginning here. And in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, it says that Peter's words as he was preaching this message of this first church gathering, it says that Peter's words it pierced their hearts. I think the King James uses the word prick their hearts, which is the same thing, and we'll talk about that shortly. And they, that was the people that were gathered, like we are here today, they said to him and to the other apostles, what should we do? Now, I find that interesting because in Acts chapter 2, there's a series of three questions that were asked. The first is found in verse 7, when they heard in their own language as the gospel had been centrally fo focused on the Jews, and, and, and now as the gospel begins to go out beyond the barriers, out beyond the boundaries of, of Jewish culture and to the Gentiles, it says that they all heard, they, they spoke in an unknown tongue or an unknown language unknown to them, and everybody heard in their own language. So the unknown was to the ones who were speaking. It would be as if I was speaking Russian or German. I didn't know that, but I was speaking and they heard in their own language. And and the first question in a series of three questions is found in verse 7. They said, how can this be? How was this happening? Uh, the second question is found in verse 12 when it says, what does this mean? And then here we see the third question, which is what we'll focus on today. And, and they said, what should we do? What should I do? Have you ever wondered in your life, what, you, what am I going to do? Have you ever been like presented with something that challenged you at your very... All and said, okay, what should I do? And these men and women had seen all of these things that we're going to talk about in a minute unfold, and they said, okay, we want to know more about this. What do we need to do? And then Peter gives them the answer. Peter replied in verse 38, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those who are far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. These three verses, or four verses, are the epitome, the icon, the unfolding. It is the cliff note version. It is salvation. What had happened is Christ had just taken the world by storm. Don't super spiritualize it. Just let your mind go back a little bit. Can you imagine in today's time, a man coming on the scene, a man claiming to be God coming on the scene, and then after you hear these claims, you're first kind of apprehensive. You don't believe them because you've heard things like this before. But then you begin to hear and see the side effects of this man. You see this man going into the hospitals and, and he goes through a whole cancer ward. And when he walks through that whole cancer ward, everyone everyone is finished. They pull their IVs out. Their, their, their hair grows back. I mean, their, their strength is just rejuvenated. And they walk out of that and they're completely healed. That would catch you and I by storm. We would be completely blown away if that happened. Can you imagine you, you hearing that this afternoon at Wheeler and Woodlick or Johnson Memorial or any of the, the funeral homes here that a man, the same man, went into the funeral home and he went to the very casket of someone who was mourning, who, who was being mourned for and he touched them and they got out of the casket. That would blow everybody's mind. Jesus had just come on the scene and he had just taken the world by storm. Everybody was talking about him. Many people followed him. 
On two occasions he fed 4,000 men, not counting women and children, and then 5,000 men, not counting women and children. 12, 15,000 people were there on the hillside as he spoke to them. He had people following him. And then he died. And the people that followed him closely now kind of followed him from afar. Only a few, including his closest confidant, scattered. Only a few chose to go with him on those last hours. A lot of people lost hope during that time. Let's be honest. They said, you know what? We've seen him do all these miracles. Even the thief on the cross said, you save others. I've heard about all these healings you've done. I've heard about all these miracles you've done. You've saved others. Save yourself. But he didn't stay dead. And that's where the church began to grow. Now imagine if you would, you, all of us, we're a group of people. We've seen somebody go through Nash General and just clean out the entire floor. We've seen somebody go to Wheeler and Woodlift and in the middle of a funeral service touch that man or touch that woman and they got up and walked out and went home with their family. We're blown away. We cannot wrap our minds around this. We see this man doing all kinds of miracles and then we see him die. And let me say this, when they saw him die, I shared with my class this morning, they didn't forget what they saw. If you've ever been on a tragic scene or if you've ever seen something that was tragic, maybe someone suffering and pass away or maybe someone who got badly injured in a wreck or something and you saw it and it just etches itself, it burns itself into your subconscious and you never forget that. They never will forget what they saw on the cross that day. But then the Bible says that Jesus not only appeared to the disciples but to many others. So if we're here and we're following this guy and he's done all these unbelievable things and then he dies and we begin to lose a little bit of hope and go, oh man, you know what, we thought he was something that he was not, so we're going to go and hide back over here. But then we see him again, you know what's going to happen? Our energy and our commitment and our desire is going to be reinvigorated. Reinvigorated. We're going to get excited again. We're going, oh my goodness, he's exactly who he said he was going to be. He rose from the dead. So what happens is, in the early church, they just didn't get together and say, hey, let's, let's have a church. It was a bunch of people. You remember, how many of you remember 9-11 vividly? Most of you remember where you were. Maybe you remember how you gathered at a home or your home or at work around a radio or a TV and you listened. I remember pastoring that day and my youth pastor came in and after I had left, I came to church and the phones were just ringing. And the secretary was answering the phones and just said, hey, people are just asking, can we get together tonight? They just want to know if we could get together and pray. And the reason being is because everybody had been so traumatized, they needed an outlet. They just needed somebody to talk to. They needed to be in the presence of people who had seen and been affected by this great tragedy. They just wanted to be with somebody. And that's what happened in the early church. They saw Jesus do all these things. They saw Him die. They lost hope. They saw Him come back to life. Their hope was revived. And they just said, we've got to get together and talk about this. So they all came together, what we deem as Pentecost. And by the way, Pentecost is not what happened in Acts. Pentecost was something that happened. Pentecost is the festival of 50. That's where the word penta comes from. It is the 50 weeks that go from the barley festival to the, um, to the final festival in the Word of God, to the Passover. And so the Passover celebrating uh, the, the angel that came through in Exodus and passed over the Jewish children as they were in captivity in Egypt. So it was a, fi it was a, 50, it was a 50 fast. And, and what happened is, not excuse me, 50 weeks, excuse me, 50 days. And, and what happened in, in this is, this was a time there was a great celebration, so there was a lot of people coming together. And as these people came together, they kind of met together just because they all had questions. And they asked the first question, how can this be? They asked the second question in Acts 2, and I think I told you verse number 13. Uh, what does this mean? And then they asked the third question, which is what we're going to talk about. Now what do I do with this? See, Peter got up and he began to speak. And at first he spoke from the words of the prophet Joel. And then after he spoke from the words of the prophet Joel, he spoke from personal testimony and what he's seen with his own eyes. I've seen this and it's affected me. And then he spoke from the prophet David or King David who prophesied in Psalms on two separate occasions he spoke. 
And he was talking about the goodness and the power and the authority of God. And the Bible says that what appeared as, as fiery tongues, it doesn't mean their tongue was on fire. We try to take so many liberties. Fire in the Old Testament oftentimes was significant. It was, it, was all, it was the presence of God, whether consuming an altar or leading the children of Israel. It was God's presence. So what he was saying was that God's presence touched their mouth. And they all began to speak in other tongues, other languages. The word tongue means glossia. It means a language. And they all began to speak. They spoke like I'm speaking today, but everybody heard in their own dialect. And they list all of those that were there that day. And that was an amazing thing. They were overwhelmed with the goodness of God. They were overwhelmed with the power of God. And in verse number 37, it says that it pierced their hearts. It punctured their hearts. The word pierced or the word pricked, it's something that catches you and, and you feel it without really having time to process it. You react. A, a good example is if you've ever been stung by a bee and you didn't know it. I mean, you're just like, oh, what was that? And you see the bee fly off laughing at you. You know what I mean? I remember years ago, man, I was going fishing. I had a machete and I was a kid and I had a buddy of mine with his little brother with us and man, we were just cutting trees and so forth trying to get this little hole and when I did, you ever do that where you're swinging about halfway you go, I need to stop but I can't. Anybody know what a hornet's nest is? Have anybody, has anybody ever heard that they will chase you home? <laughs> Let me just testify that is absolutely true. They will chase you. Yes, sir. Thankfully, I wasn't allergic, but man, I hit that thing, and when I did, bam, they just said, hey, everybody get that boy right there. <laughs> and I'm running through the woods, you know, and they're just all over me. My, I, don't, I left my friend and his brother. He tried to put his brother on his back, and that, that was a benefit to him because they stung his brother. I didn't have anybody to put on my back, so they just ate me up, man. I mean, they chased me through the woods, chased me all the way home. And I mean, I think I was stung that day either 16, 15 times that day. I didn't have any allergic reaction to it, and I'm very thankful for that, but I was just completely consumed. And what he's talking about here is he's talking about something that would just attack you or pierce you or prick you and you really don't prepare for it, but it happens and when it happens, you react to it. He said that the Word of God just pricked their hearts. And when they were pricked in their hearts, when they were just struck in their hearts, they asked this question. Here's the question today. What do we do? Do you know I spent a lot of my time praying, seemingly telling God what to do? God, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. Lord, I want you to help this. I want you. And I kind of direct him in, in the way I want him to go instead of sitting back and saying, Okay, God, what do you want me to do? And they were so convicted in their spirits, they said to the apostles and to Peter, What shall we do? Today, I want to make this as simple as I can. I believe my greatest calling as a pastor, as a Christian, is to share the good news. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, you don't have to turn there, but you can write it down and read it over and over and over again. Paul tells the church at Corinth, and I want to challenge you, examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Guys, I want to challenge the question today, what should I do when it comes to knowing Christ. I'm not asking you if you enjoy coming to Parkwood. I love having you here and I hope you do. I'm not even asking you how long you've been a member of this church or any church. I'm asking you a very important question today. Do you absolutely, without hesitation, know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? What must I do? I want you to look at this if you could. Number one, I want you to see it's found in verse number 38. The question must be individually answered. He says, each of you, let each of you. We are so good at looking at who needs the message today, aren't we? Especially when you talk about husbands and wives. Because every wife, when you're talking about husbands, every wife is going, you know what, I don't want any distractions. I want to take his phone and I want to hide it. I want him to look. Are you listening, honey? Are you listening to what he's got to say? When we talk about wives and what wives need to do, Psalm, Proverbs 31, husband's like, sweet, I want to I hold the baby. I just feel led in my heart to hold the baby today. You know, I, I want to take care of the children. I want to teach in Sunday school today. Let me do that. I want you to be able to give your undivided attention to the message. 
Or maybe somebody's wronged us and we hear that message and talking about forgiveness and instead of us taking it upon ourselves and go seeking forgiveness, we say, I sure hope they're listening. I sure hope God gets a hold of their heart. But see, that's not how Christianity works. Every one of us, myself, chiefly in this, we have to give an account for our own lives. You know there are people that can affect you, that can influence you, but you have the final decision in the choices you make. Matthew 7, Jesus is speaking. He said, you, hypocr you hypocrite. Take the log out of your own eye before you start trying to focus on the speck in somebody else's eye. So many times we're focused on everyone else and what they're facing and what they need rather than our individual self. Years ago, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I was at the funeral of a family member of mine. And I stood there knowing the condition of my family member in the very back of the service and I listened as the uh, elders at this time stood up and basically took my family member whom by all indication never knew Jesus as his Lord and Savior and prayed him into paradise. That's what they said. We gathered around him right before he died and, and we prayed him into paradise. And he's with the Lord now. And I'm thinking to myself, sitting in the very back, my heart is really just beating heavy. And I'm like, you're wrong. You did not pray him into anything. Nobody can get you into eternity with God save Jesus Christ. And it's an individual choice that each person must make. Hebrews 9 says, it's appointed unto me in one time to die. That's it. Thank God it's not appointed unto us three and four times to die. It's appointed unto us once to die, and then after this we stand in the judgment. So my question today is, are you ready to make an individual decision? I want to make this statement, and I want you to listen. This may not be your last opportunity, but I can almost guarantee you that what we're presenting today will be one of your greatest opportunities. It's individual. God, please help us make an individual choice today. Number two, I asked the question. This is a simple message today. Why would we not? Look at verse 38. He says, what must I do? And in verse 38, he says, each of you must repent and turn of your sin. This is a church word. We have abused it and used it so much, nobody even knows what it means anymore. What does he say when they say, okay, what do you want me to do, Peter? Tell me what you want to do. He says, okay, first of all, you've got to make the choice. Nobody can make it for you. And secondly, he says, I want you to repent. And we've heard that word so much. We've seen uh, the, the, the plays where John the Baptist screams out, repent. We've seen videos where the wild John the Baptist screams, repent. But it was a message that not only John the Baptist preached, but Jesus did as well. Let me tell you what repentance means. And I've actually done messages on this that lasted two, three weeks. But repentance at its very essence, it means you turn away from something. Specifically sin. They said, Peter, what do you want me to do? Something's going on. There's something different about this. I see something happening and I want to know more. What do you want me to do? And they said, well, you've got to make your own decision. And he says, the first step is turn away from your sin. And sin is such a generic word, it's such a broad word. But throughout the Word of God, I want to read a few verses. Matthew 3, 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Acts 3, 19, repent therefore and be converted. Acts 8, 22, repent of your wickedness. Hebrews 6, 1, so let us stop going over the basic teachings. Let us go on into mature understanding. Surely we don't need to start again at the fundamental importance of repenting from your evil deeds. You know what he says, the author of Hebrews says, that repentance is foundational. Listen, what he's saying is the life that we're living is not working. You need to recognize it's not working and then turn from it. I've kicked my toe in the middle of the night several times and not one time did a curse word heal it. Why, why are you doing this, he's saying? He's saying, listen, I want you to turn. I want you to see a recognition. I want you to have a recognition. Excuse me, not see. I want you to have a recognition of who Jesus is. I want you to see the perfection of who Jesus is. I want you to understand that God in His infinite wisdom created you specifically. He designed you just how you are. And this world is doing everything it can to unravel what God created. I want you to recognize that there's more than what you see in this earth. I want you to recognize that He loves you. I want you to turn from your sins. That's all. And turn to God. You say, well, I can't be perfect. Nobody can. 
I'm not perfect. I'm the furthest thing from perfect. That's why he says, I want you to repent. Watch. I want you to turn from that way of living to God. I love that. Repentance is not just stopping doing certain sins. Repentance is stopping a particular way of life and turning to God for the rest of it. Have you ever seen, maybe at a, a crowded theme park or a beach or, or something like that, you ever seen the mom and the dad holding the children's hands? You ever seen that? The mom and dad are, and, and the kids are like, okay, I'm just, you know, they're just going everywhere. You know, they don't care. They have no idea where they're going. Okay, let me ask you a simple question. Where are the kids going? What? Where their parents are going. You guys can speak. Up. You're like, <laughs> That's what I hear up here. Honest to goodness. I'm like, where are the parents going? <laughs> it's like a cartoon from the Peanuts character. <laughs> and I think you do that sometimes because you want people to think you know the answer, but you're unsure about it. <laughs> so anyway, where are the parents going? Where are the kids going? They're going where the parents lead them. That's exactly right. The kids don't stop and say, stop, right here. You need to tell me, Mom and Dad, what direction we're going. You need to tell me why we're going that way. You need to tell me how we're going to get there. And you need to tell me what we're going to do once we get there. Or I'm staying right here. That doesn't happen. You know what they do? They go like this. Because they trust that wherever Mom and Dad is carrying them is the place that they need to end up. And salvation is me saying, God... I'm just going to hold on to you and I'm going to trust that wherever you're leading me is the place that I need to end up. I don't know all the direction of my life. I really don't. And the older I get, you would think I would have more of a sense of direction. The older I get, the more I realize how, how much I lack in directional life-changing decisions. But I do know that the Word of God has proven time and time again that if I just hold on to Him, and trust He's going to get me to where I need to end up. What do I need to do, they said. Peter said it's not a decision everybody can make for one another. You've got to make this decision. And the first part of this decision is you need to repent. You need to turn from the things that are robbing you of what you were created to be. But don't just turn from them. An alcoholic can turn from alcohol and still not be saved. Someone who's addicted to bad language can turn from that and still not be saved. He says, turn from them unto God. Let me use another child illustration. You ever see a child get scared? Mom, dad's around? What do they do? Thank you. I understood that one. I'm going to preach like that one Sunday. You wait and see. I'm going to say, take out your Bible. Turn, 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 turn. I'm, hey, I'm going to do that and see how much you get out of it, okay? Because that's what you do to me. Tell me, amen. I'll just say the first and last word and everything else will move in between. That's exactly right. When a child gets scared, a, a dog may come on the scene or, or they may hear something they do. They turn and they just run to mom. They run to dad and they latch on to them and they turn to the parent. They turn to the one who's going to offer them for protection. They turn to the one who has shown them unconditional love. And that's what Peter's saying. He's saying, guys, you're broken. You're hurting. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're mad. Maybe you're so analytical you tried to reason God out of life. But you know that the life that you're living is not working. Turn from that life and just turn to God. Embrace God. Turn to God. Repentance is not just stopping my sinful ways. Repentance is embracing and turning to God. And look at this. Look at the results. I'm still in verse 38. Look at the, it's like a Wednesday night program. The result of Wednesday. I mean, the result of Wednesday. <laughs> That's what happens when you mumble. I get confused. The result of repentance. Found in verse number 38. He says, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Let me just throw this in there too and be baptized. I have this question asked a lot. Why should I be baptized? Baptism is a very important aspect. Let me tell you why. It doesn't make you saved. It's a result of your salvation. See, when you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's a very intimate and personal thing. You can do it in front of this church, or you can do it at home, or you can do it in your vehicle, you can do it wherever. That's you and the Lord, and no matter how many people surround you, nobody knows your heart except you and God. But when a person is baptized, it's like publicly revealing what God has done in the innermost parts of your heart. And the question is asked, preacher, why should I be baptized? I think the most simple answer is because God's commanded us to do that. 
But I think a, a very important answer is because I'm proud of what God's done in my life. You know, it used to be when my children were born, this is what we would take out. Remember that? You had the, the wallet like that big, and it had pictures. Now what do we take out? The phone. That's exactly right. When Hudson and Xenia were born, there's too many times I talked to Parker, and they go, look. And I say, yeah, man, he's got pictures. Of, you know what's funny, Parker? You know this to be true, too. You know what's funny, you and Andrew both, is that when you take a picture, it's funny, they'll take a thousand and one pictures, and they look the same in every picture. <laughs> oh, I did. And every picture, you know, look at this one, look at this one, look at this one. I'm like, yeah, that's beautiful, look at that, that's awesome, man. And I'm like, okay, it's the same picture, man. <laughs> look at this one, look at this one, look at this one, look at this one, look at this one. I'm going, yes, I get it, because you know what, they're proud. They're proud to show what God's given them. They're proud of their children, they're proud of the beauty that God's created. They're just proud, they want to show it off. They want to show other people what God has done in their life by giving them this child. And when a person's baptized, they're proud. Man, let me show you what God has done for me. Does baptism save? Absolutely. Absolutely not, it doesn't save. Jesus saves. Salvation is coming only from Christ. But baptism is just you showing off what God's done inside of you. He says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And I love that. The word forgiveness of sin or the phrase means to be completely free, to have a full pardon, to be totally liberated, and to be put in remission. Guys, I think we forget what it means to be forgiven for our sins. Paul struggled with that. Paul said, this one thing I know, forgetting that which is behind me, I press towards the mark to finally become all that Christ saved me for and wants me to be. He said, I've got to let go of that which is behind me. It's haunting me. I can't do that. But every single epistle, every single letter that Paul wrote, if you study it, he's always referred to his past. So even though he recognized he needed to put his past behind him, he still struggled with the demons of his past. And I'm sure that most of us today struggle with the demons of our past. But you know the only one that's struggling with the demons of your past is you because God settled it when you repented from it. Isn't that amazing? The only one who struggles over my demons really and truly is me because God put it to bed when I repented of my sins. I used to tell children in the children's church when I was a youth pastor, you know what that means? That means if you go to God and you say, God, do you remember when I talked ugly to my mom? He's going to say, no, I don't remember that. What are you talking about? Because He forgets it. He casts it away. That is an awesome thing. They said, what do we do? Tell me what we do. I'm just tired of living like this. I want more. And He says, okay, you've got to make a decision that nobody else can make for you. You've got to turn in the light that you're living because it's heading you in the wrong direction. You've got to turn specifically to God. And as a result of that, be baptized to show what God has done. Be a testimony to others. And God will grant you forgiveness of your sin. See, that's what's bearing down on us. That's what's hurting us. Our sin is what's destroying us. And He says, I want to free you from those sins. And then look at the latter part of verse 38. He says, then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's two words in this passage. He says, you will. And then He gives the next one, uh, receive. Let me talk about that for a moment because there's a lot of confusion that's seen in that particular passage sometimes. If you can imagine with me today a diagram, and on that diagram it's a triangle. You've seen it many times before. You've got God written in the middle of the triangle. You've got the Father up top, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you can put them any way you want. There are three distinctive personalities, but it's God. Are you with me so far? There are some of my great friends that teach that you get saved and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and we cut that side of the triangle off and we put it in our lives and the more you grow and the greater you grow, you receive the Holy Spirit later on. Now if I had the ability to, to diagram this, what I would show you is we're chipping away and we're cutting away at this Trinity. If you take Christ out of the Trinity, the Trinity ceases to be a Trinity. 
If, the, if, if you receive Christ at salvation, the Holy Spirit later, you're putting degrees on each individual. You're saying Christ is for the sinner, but the Holy Spirit is for the greater than the sinner. And that's a wrong teaching. Paul said, for by one spirit are we all baptized. The word baptized means to cover or to consume. So here's what he's saying. He's saying this, when I receive the Lord as my personal Savior, I receive not just part of God, I receive all that God is. Jesus Himself said that I'm going to leave you physically, but I'm going to send, and He describes Him two ways, as a comforter and as an advocate. He's going to be in my stead. He's going to be with you, not at a later date, but on your moment at the very second of your salvation. You and I are filled or under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Watch this because it can be very confusing. They said, man, I want what you got. Peter, what have I got to do? Peter said, you've got to make that decision. Nobody else can make it for you. You've got to repent and say, Lord, I'm not happy with the way my life is going. I'm not happy with the decisions that I've made. And I turn from those. And when I turn from those, Lord, like a scared child, I'm going to turn to You and I'm going to trust You as my God. Lord, if the ability allows me, I'm going to be baptized so people can know what's done in my particular life. And because of that, according to Your promise, I'm going to be forgiven for my sin. My sin debt is zero balance. I may be haunted from my past, but You've dealt with it already. You're not going to throw it in my face like some people do. I have been completely cleaned from that particular thing. And as a result of this new life, you don't have to walk around scared to death. You don't have to walk around by yourself. I'm going to feel you. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in you. So when you get ready to make decisions, instead of making decisions filtered through your own thought process that you've had, that I've had, that has been contaminated since birth, you're going to make decisions filtered through the Holy Spirit. So now when you go through night, you do this, instead of letting profanities come out like you used to do, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you're going to say, it's not going to do me any good. Oh my goodness, Lord, help me grow a new toe. You understand, I'm trying to be a little funny, but you understand. When truth and lies, and lie seems to be the easy way out, and truth seems to be the mountain that's climbed ahead of you, you're going to choose truth because you know it's right. That's the Holy Spirit's influence in our life. See, we talk about how awesome it would be to be in biblical times, but according to the Word of God, we're in the greatest times of all. No, you not. Paul said to the church in 1 Corinthians, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. So once we come to know Christ, we don't have to walk through this world on our own. We've got a promise of the Holy Spirit. And then the last question I'll ask and answer today is, who is this offering to? Look at verse 39. To you and to your children. 2 Corinthians says, As, God, as God's fellow workers... We urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For He says, in the time of favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the time of favor. Today is the day of salvation. Romans 13 says, this is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer than we first believed. Can I just say something here? If I could, just for a moment. I hear a lot of talk about the state of our country. You hear a lot of talk about the state of our country. A lot of things we shake our heads and we say, I can't believe. I had the opportunity to go with several people from the church on Thursday night and watch Unplanned. Somebody asked me, was it good? I said, I don't know if you can put the label good on it. It was awesome. Because it's, it's a reality. And me, man, it, it, I went through so many emotions. I wanted to kick the trash can. I wanted to rip the seat up. I wanted to cry. I just, it was real. It was absolute events. And we think, how in the world can a nation in laughter sign a bill into play that says at any time we could take the life of an unborn child? How in the world? I don't understand this, but the reality is I do understand this. I don't have a lot of time to get into it, but America is in a decline that is not should not, cannot be a surprise because history and biblical reference tells us that this is exactly where we're at now. 
Bible talks that the love of people, the natural, the, the real love of people will wax cold. Their hearts will be hardened. It says that they're going to call evil righteous and righteous evil. These are significant signs that prepare Christ's return. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls them labor pains. If a woman is in labor, she is getting ready to deliver. You bring her to the hospital because a baby is getting ready to come into this world. And the Bible says when you see these signs and the world is in labor pains and is preparing for Christ's second return. I mean, we're not even going into biblical prophecy, uh, the, the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem, the recognition of Jerusalem. We're not talking about all those things that have come in recent years. We're talking about just current events. It's not something that surprises us. It is something that absolutely foretold before Christ comes back. And that's why Paul says in the book of Romans, our time is running out. Wake up before it's too late. As in any offer, there's only two answers. Some people argue three. Yes, no, maybe, or maybe later. But you know, when we say maybe or maybe later, that's just really saying no for now. You know, you, you go and you get on your knee and you say, Honey, will you marry me? And she goes, Maybe later. <laughs> if you ever ask that question and she says, Maybe later, just get up and go find somebody else because that means no. Unless I can't find anybody else I like better, then I'll come back to you as a last resort. That's what it means. And if some of you are married as a result of that, I will meet you right after church in my office and we'll set up times to start meeting. So there's two choices today. Yes. Or no. So what is the question? The question was asked by these individuals. What do I do? And here's what he said you need to do. You need to repent of your sin. God, I can't do this anymore. And you need to turn to God like a small child running for protection. Be baptized just to show as an act of obedience to the Lord. And God will forgive you for your sins. And God has cleansed you from your sins. That doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again. It means that you're going to be a little, weary, a little more weary about sin. And when you do sin, you've got an advocate, the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of you, who pleads, as Romans 8 says, on our behalf before the Lord, in forgiveness so we're not in this by ourselves. You say, who is this for? I love what he says. It's for you and your children. Parents, children follow what they see. And I want to encourage every mom and every dad to think about the life that you have chosen. Is it the life you want your child to choose as well? If you're here today and you say, I have no idea about my salvation, then what predicament does that leave your children in? I love Joshua's response when he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It wasn't just him and his children. It was everybody that was associated with him. He wanted to lead the charge. Maybe there's someone today that says, you know what, I need to lead the charge. I need to choose salvation today. I've been a church member. I've been a good person. I've been a religious person. I've been agnostic. I know that there's something. I just don't know what it is. But today, I need to turn to Jesus. What is the question? What do I need to do? What was the answer? Repent and turn to God. What is the result? Forgiveness of sin. Who can do it? You and your children can do it. But the choice is completely up to you. Would you bow your heads? Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians 13. Examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. I want to go old school today. I just feel like there's some people today that have a burden. Their hearts are heavy. Maybe not necessarily for you, maybe for someone else. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to open this altar for anyone that wants to come and just pray today. Not going to tarry long. You just, you just have a heart, a passion. Somebody's on your mind. Something you're dealing with. I'm just going to invite this I'm going, to, I'm going to invite you at this moment to just come and talk to them. But i got to ask another question today. You're here. And I do ask, if you would, just to reflect in your own life, maybe with your head bowed or your eyes closed, just so no one 
has that sense of being put in the spotlight. But I just, I ask today, if there's one here that says, I don't know the Lord. I just don't. I'm struggling. Well, I, I, you know, maybe there's something. Maybe I've always thought there was something. But, but just today, there's just something in my heart that tells me I don't want to keep going the way I'm going. I want to know Christ. I want to know for sure. If that's you today, guys, I'm not here to embarrass you or pull you aside. I'm just answering the question based on biblical results. What do I need to do? The first step is repent. You're here today and you say, Preacher, I do want to know Christ. I want to know Him. I don't want to be in this world by myself anymore. I want to give my life to Him today. I don't know really what that means, but I want to give my life to Him. I don't want to fight these battles by myself anymore. If that's you today, right where you're at, let's take God's Word at face value right where you're at. I'm just going to give you, this is not a, a prayer that I've read directly out of the Bible. This is just taken from bits and pieces of the Word of God, but it's all biblical in its foundation. God, I believe in you. That's the first thing. Would you right where you're at say, Lord, I believe in you. And God, I invite you into my life. Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Help me now to live for you. God, I'm yours. At your seat or at this altar, if you prayed that prayer today, can I ask you just to slip, simply slip, slip your hand up for a moment? Just hold it up for a moment. I promise you, we're not having people looking around and scouting you. Know, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Several people raised their hands. And awesome. That's awesome. You can put your hands down. Now, does that mean I'm perfect? No. Does that mean I'm never going to do wrong again? No. What it means is you're not doing this by yourself. What it means is according to God's Word, and there is a God, that He loves you enough to be with you. What it means is that you're saved. Father, as we close today, God, as we close today, there's some people that made a decision and they not, they were they were manly enough. God, it takes some man to stand strong. They were lady enough. It takes a lady to stand strong to say, I need God. And I invite God into my life today. God, as they make this decision, as they made this decision, please give them strength. Please give them wisdom. Please, God, give them your protection. For those today at their seat or maybe here at this altar, just pouring their heart out to you. Whatever it is they're facing, whatever it is they're dealing with, I just pray that in the name of Jesus, you would give them peace and direction and their request. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before you leave today, I just want to say, if you raised your hand and you said, I accepted the Lord, will you see me right afterwards?